as you can see, I use a variety of different fasteners to do all of this, and they all have they all have their place. They have their strengths and their weaknesses. Um, I set out from the beginning to not have any mixed metals in the boat. When I found her, um, she pretty much had every kind of metal that would you'd expect to see in a boat was was in here. There was uh, there was iron, there was mild steel, galvanized steel, stainless steel, bronze, copper, uh, and some lead ballasts um, as well, and also what turned out to be zinc ballast. Um, so between between all of that, she had a lot of um, galvanic issues. <laughs> the wood around the less noble metals uh, was just disintegrating, uh, particularly around the, the, you know, the original iron fasteners, which were themselves gone. Um, there was one of the keel bolts, which originally, I think, were 5 eighths keel bolts, um, uh, was down to Sort of about the size of, of a normal sewing needle. Um, <laughs> that was all that was left. So, copper and bronze, they they're fine together because they're very close. Also, bronze and lead are really quite close. Um, when you go from a typically uh, a non-ferrous metal to a ferrous metal, that is a big jump. Usually, it depends what it is and where it is on the chart. But um, the further the apart they are. In, on the nobility scale, the more problems you will have. So I use bolts, screws, trunnels, and drifts. Now, bolts and screws, well, we'll start with bolts. Bolt, I mean, bolts and screws are both fairly self-explanatory to most people. They've seen them, they've probably used them. Um, bolts are, um, honestly, I think if you if you could only have one kind of fastener for everything, um, bolts would probably not be a bad choice. Um, they are... They're the strongest way of fastening anything uh, with mechanical fasteners that I know of, anyway. Um, but they do have some downsides as well. Um, they tend to be a big chunk of metal, which is more expensive, heavier. Um, you have to go all the way through a thing in order to fasten. A nut and a washer and a threaded part of a bolt is, is a fairly thick assembly. So if, you, if you're putting something together where this needs to be hidden, um, your counter bore is gonna be pretty substantial and sometimes that's not okay. You can't remove that much material always. Um, uh, in some situations, if you don't do, if you don't like peen over the head of the bolt or use some sort of thread locker, the nut could work its way off. I've never personally had that happen. The, a bolt is, in my mind, at least uh, probably the best all around against different different forces acting on it. Um, it's very very strong against extraction loading. Um, and one of the strongest against shear loading, which is like a cr so an extraction load would be um, a force that's trying to pull whatever piece this fastens together apart. Um, the only way that a bolt is really going to commonly fail um, against extraction is that the wood is actually going to split um, and fall apart, which, you know, one could argue is not the fastener's fault. Um, anyway, uh, and then um, because they're really quite, you know, substantial, and they go through the whole, the whole piece, um, they are one of the better things against shear loading as well. Um, this is one of the big ones. Uh, this is of the size that I do for my centerline bolts, uh, keel bolts, uh, bolts in the stem, etc. This is 5 8 bronze rod. Um, and then all the way down to the smallest bolts that I use are 5 16 and these are actually for 
uh, side fastenings between um, one fuddock to another or a fuddock to a floor timber or whatever. Um, so these are quite a bit smaller. Um, any, these are the only uh, pre-made bolts that I have and use consistently um, because all the frames are the same thickness. Uh, so that allowed me to order a size and have them all pre-made and um, everything else is custom so every single keel bolt is a different length um, every bolt through the stem and the stern post is a different length so uh, to do these I buy um, six foot lengths of silk and bronze rod uh, find out the length that I need cut the length I need and um, and then I actually cut the threads myself with it with a um, tap and die um, I suppose it's not a tap and die, it's just a die, actually. People say that, but it's wrong, so. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think on the whole, like if, if you lived in a world in which you could only have one type of fastener, a bolt would probably be what you would go for. Secondly, I use screws. So these are just, in form, they're just your standard wood screw. It's a pretty big one. These are number 18s, uh, three inch number 18s. And these are what I use for probably about two thirds of the plank fastening. Um, so any place that a plank needs um, a drive fastener is what I would call it anyway, um, i.e. a fastener that can pull two pieces together in the action of being put in. Um, I use a screw, so you know if something's hanging off by an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch or whatever, I'll put a screw there. Um, and they're pretty good. They're um, they're bronze, so they're not cheap, but they are. It's all relative. <laughs> um, uh, relatively cheap. Um, they are really quite strong. Sort of medium high. Uh, medium to high strong <laughs> um, against extraction loading, um, which is mostly, I mean, that's mostly the forces that are on planks. Um, they have a little bit of shear loading when the boat's moving around a lot and the whole thing is, you know, but for the most part, what any plank fastener is doing is trying to stop the plank from coming off. And they're entirely acceptable at that. Um, they're not, that great against shear loading what tends to happen um well i mean you think about screws and nails are are related and you think about what it's like when you're pulling a nail out of something with a pry bar or something um you know it doesn't you're pulling it sideways it's not really it doesn't really resist that very well um so if there's any force on a plank um that this is holding it's gonna um eventually it's gonna wallow out the bore that it's in and it's not going to be holding very well. Um, but like I said, there's not much of that acting on planks, so this is a place to use these. You know, I would not, um, I wouldn't screw together a deadwood assembly, mm. or I wouldn't screw down a mass step. Um, things like th where there's going to be forces in different directions pushing on it. The third type of bronze fastener that I use, and this is by far the least common, um, is drifts, which are the most simple. These are just lengths of silk and bronze rod with a very rudimentary point ground on one end and a very rudimentary head um, peened with a ball peen hammer on the other end. And then I like to cut in a few barbs down the length of what's going to be buried into the receiving piece. Um, with uh, a hatchet, um, which at least makes me think that it's going to resist extraction better. Um, I don't know if it does or not. I hope it does. Um, uh, and then these get actually, I have a sp special drill bit for, there's two different sizes of these that I've used here and there. Um, and I have a drill bit that is a 64th of an inch undersize. Um, and that I think is pretty important for resisting extraction with these because um, unlike trunnels, which I'll get to in a second, obviously this does not compress as it goes in and lock itself in place. Um, 
So you need to kind of build that into the bore for it. Um, I do not use many of these. I've, uh, I use these for pinning down the ends of deck beams and for um, pinning some of the deadwood blocking together. And then last but not least are trannels. So uh, trannel is an old word um, coming from tree nail actually. So it's, it's a essentially it's a wooden rivet. Um, it's not really a nail. Typically, um, in most traditions, there's a number of different traditions of how to use these, um, but in most of the traditions that I've seen, uh, these are meant to actually go all the way through a piece like a bolt. Um, so you bore your hull, you send this thing through, and sizing these is very finicky. Because um, it's a natural material, it reacts to changes in moisture and temperature and all that. So one that fits today might not fit tomorrow. So <laughs> choose, uh, you got to choose your timing. Um, and also, you have to be pretty careful about keeping these dry. You do not want to the, these to be pre-swelled, because if you put these in pre-swelled and then they dry, they're not tight anymore, which is no good. Um, so oftentimes people have like a special not exactly a kiln, but like a, a hot box for keeping these in um, so that they're, they're dry when they go in. One of the things that you're banking on is that your small dry peg, it's been kept very dry, low moist, moisture content, is going to go into a larger piece, which the interior of, of it is going to have a higher moisture content. So this is going to go in, it's going to get wedged and everything, but also um, as soon as it contacts that uh, inner part of the timber that is a higher moisture content, it's going to swell up and it's going to lock itself there. This is the principle. Also, with boats, you know, obviously you're putting this thing in the water, so hopefully get some of its own moisture from somewhere. Um, so they tell me, anyway. Um, I'll believe it when I see it. But. <laughs> if you're fastening all the way through with one of these, it goes all the way through, you cut it off while it's sticking out just a little bit and then actually you make um, you make a little split in the end um, on the outside it's this way which is across the grain of the planks um, because if you put it in line with the grain of the planks um, when you drive your wedge in you risk blowing your plank apart which would be very sad um, and also not recommended um, on the inside because the frame the grain of the frame is going in the opposite direction, your wedge uh, goes horizontally the opposite way in opposition to that grain. Um, and the theory behind this is very simple and probably obvious that um, these wedges going into those little splits um, flares the end of the trunnel enough that it can't pull out either way in theory, even if the piece in the middle doesn't swell up and doesn't lock and all that, the wedges should be able to carry it to some degree at least. Um, such is the theory. Um, now, there are, there are a number of different reasons for using these. Uh, one of them is economic. <laughs> they are essentially free if you have the mechanism for making them, which I do. Um, and I really lucked out with materials in that, like, four or five years ago, I um, had a windfall of, like, six or seven trees that had been dry for 15 years already, um, all black locusts, which black locust is the species, the go-to species in North America for these. Um, uh, and this stuff was already dry and had it all milled up and makes good trunnels. So, um, Rosalind did not originally have them, but um, it is period off that, you know, other boats of the time period did, so it's not out of keeping. Um, uh, they're great to use in any place where you have more planing to do, or might hit it with an ads, or something like that, where if you hit this with any sort of tool, um, it's going to change the kind of day you're having. Um, <laughs> If you hit this, it doesn't. So that's nice. Um, they 
they are also one of the best things uh, when it comes to resisting shear forces. So where, where you do run into shear forces in the planking process is in putting them on. You don't get a lot more when the boat is sailing, when it's in the water or any of that, but um, in order to actually get the plank situated and in place, uh, there's, there's always, you need to, what's called edge setting. You need to edge set the plank a little bit. Until it's fastened and it's been this shape for a while and it's settled into it, the plank is gonna wanna spring back. Um, and as I've mentioned, screws are not great at resisting that. Trunnels, though, are really great at resisting that. So any place that I need to edge set, you know, any really any significant amount, I try to put some trunnels so that uh, so that it stays where I put it, basically. Um. <laughs> uh, disadvantages of trunnels: uh, it's a natural material. Um, it's very finicky to install them, to get them sized correctly, to not break them during installation. Uh, they also can rot, in theory. I've never actually seen that happen, um, but it is wood, so it could happen. Um, they're probably, I don't know, they're, they've got to be, I think, one of the worst for resisting extraction loading. Um, in that they don't have the only they're only working on friction um, and while it's a lot it's comparatively a lot of surface area so it's comparatively a lot of friction it's still only friction so um, again I have never actually seen a trunnel fail against extraction forces uh, but I'm entirely willing to believe that it's possible they also can limit the scope of further restoration and upkeep and maintenance that you might want to do to a boat in that you've made a relatively very large hole through something um, there's only so many times you can do that if you want to take a plank off I even on a boat this size I wanted to take these planks off and there's a bunch of trunnel holes. I don't know how comfortable I'd feel making a new set of trunnel holes uh, because then that's weakening the frames quite a bit. So uh, you're more limited in your options as far as disassembly and maintenance and all that sort of thing. Um, but like I said, there's a lot going for them too. <laughs> <laughs> Forty minutes on camera. <laughs> you should be good with it now. 